Hello guys, welcome back to episode number 30 of the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm excited to be recording a solo episode today. I know we've not had the Q&A in a while, so I thought I'd bring that back and answer two or three listener questions today, just see how much time that we have spur. And the first subject is on blood sugar and feeling like hypoglycemic and instable blood sugar control. And the second question is on, let's see, it's on someone who's developed eczema pretty recently and she's done everything and still can't overcome it. So we're going to go through those, but I thought I'd just catch you up on what's been going on in my life. So I've just come back from a trip to London to a practitioner event run by Great Plains Laboratory. And if you've ever run an organic acid test or a mycotoxin test, they're typically the company that are used most commonly. And we learned about the organic acid test and what that is. It's very interesting. I've used that before, but I'm definitely going to start using that more because it's a good test to look at mitochondrial function, potential environmental toxicity, systemic candida. And then we looked at environmental toxins like glyphosate, mold, and we got a free test as well, a complimentary test. So I'm going to go ahead with the mycotoxins. That's looking for mold kind of byproducts and whether mold could be contributing to any of my health symptoms, particularly the histamine issues. I'm definitely much better tolerating of them than I was a few years ago, but I still feel like I have ongoing sensitivities to some of the things like chocolate and vinegars and certain types of meat. So I really want to figure out what's going on. I'm like the health detective. I'm not going to stop until I've got all the answers possible. So maybe the mycotoxin test is going to show up with something. I want to have a mold expert on the podcast as well so if you have any ideas on who I can invite let me know and I'll try and get them on the show as well probably to be selfish and ask a ton of my questions if that was the case for me but we'll see it might be another journey for me to go on and if it is the case then as frustrating as that'll be and probably expensive as well I think it would provide some more insight and help me learn and grow as a practitioner as well so there's always a silver lining which is good and yeah, my trip to London, I had a really good time, met some new people in the industry and also met up with a few of my clients as well, which is always nice. It's good to, I obviously have my local clients as well, but it's always good to catch up with those who live remotely, who don't live nearby to me. So that was really nice as well. I ate some lovely healthy foods. I had a lot of matcha because I have to try every single matcha place I go to to see who does it best and there was a bar there's a matcha place called I forgot the name but I'll link it in the show notes as well for anyone who's interested and that was the best one that I had on the trip so I'll definitely link that there as well but yeah I'm excited to get into the the episode recording today and let's start off with Cara who is question asker number one and she's 27 and she says I've been experiencing issues with my blood sugar since I was around 23. I've always suffered with migraines which I know can be related to however over the past couple of years my blood sugar swings have been much more problematic. I always need to carry snacks with me and know I need to know when and where my next meal is going to be and this is impacting my life and spontaneity. After reading some things online, I have no idea why this is happening to me and what I can do about it as I'm pretty healthy and already exercise regularly. The symptoms I experience include shakiness, the classic hangry sensation, sweaty palms and inability to focus. Apart from these symptoms and the headaches, I feel pretty much, I feel pretty healthy, but I want to figure out what is going on with my body. Here's an overview of my typical diet. Breakfast is usually oatmeal with walnuts and berries or a smoothie made with ingredients like spinach, almond milk, banana that I buy on my way to work. Lunch is typically something like a chicken salad wrap, gluten free, with cut up vegetables and some fruit. And dinner would be something like fish or meat with potatoes and vegetables. I snack frequently on homemade bliss balls made with nut butter, dates, cacao, hummus not with not with hummus she also has hummus and oat cakes or fruit for snacks as well 
She works in an office, so, so throughout the day she's pretty sedentary, but she exercises three to four times a week, usually something like a spin class or a two to three mile run if the weather permits. And she says, I've always had blood sugar, I've always had my blood sugar tested by doctors and it's always normal. And there's no history of diabetes in my family. So I've definitely experienced similar things to that as well. I remember like having to have snacks with me the whole time, literally having an anxiety attack. If there was no food around, if there was no healthy places to eat, or there was just no food options at all. And that would make my symptoms 10 times worse, knowing that my blood sugar is going to drop and getting stressed out and that in itself is going to spike and crash your blood sugar levels too. But I think with this and with a lot of people as well, they confuse symptoms of hypoglycemia. So hypo is low levels of blood sugar that these symptoms typically um, sound like like your blood sugar's crashing and you get those typical things but sometimes that can actually be hyperglycemia sorry so high blood sugar this can happen with other hormones as well sometimes symptoms of hyperthyroidism can be actually hypothyroidism sometimes high cortisol can look like low cortisol and vice versa so oftentimes and with my clients as well when they believe that they're experiencing hypoglycemia attacks i ask them to track their blood sugar and what we actually see is that their blood sugar is quite elevated sometimes you can imagine if you're watching me on youtube now if your blood sugar is quite high and it drops a little bit you're still in the high zone but that drop in itself can cause symptoms of hypoglycemia but you're not actually low in blood sugar at all. You're still really high, but it's just that it's dropped a little bit. Or sometimes what happens is when blood sugar's high, your body releases a ton of insulin. So that insulin pulls all of the blood sugar from the bloodstream and sends it to the cells. And that can rapidly decrease your blood sugar and sometimes a little bit too low as well. So especially if you're tracking your blood sugar or you've done like an oral glucose tolerance test and you're post meal reading is lower than it was to start then that's a sign that your insulin is likely way too high it's been overproduced and your body is dragging all of that blood sugar from the bloodstream into the cells and leaving the bloodstream quite empty of blood sugar and then that leads you to feel hungry again particularly for carbohydrates or caffeine or sugar to bring levels back up and that up and down throughout the day can be very stressful and inflammatory to the body so I think that may be what's going on as well. I see hyperglycemia, so high blood sugar, much more than I see low blood sugar, but always there's always the case that it's an outlier to that rule. But that's just typically what I see. And remember that I deal with a lot of hormone imbalances and PCOS. So it could be that the people that I'm seeing is a little bit skewed. But it's important to keep that in mind as well with the hyper and hypo causing similar symptoms as well. So just as an overview of what insulin resistance is, because I may refer to this term a few times throughout this episode. So as I mentioned before, when you eat food, particularly carbohydrates, your body produces insulin to bring down the levels of blood glucose, which naturally rise after you eat some of these things. Your blood sugar likes to be tightly regulated. So around four or five for most people. And if it gets too high, then insulin will take that blood sugar from the bloodstream and its job is to send it to the cells where it's used for energy or it's stored as glycogen. But what can happen is over time, if the receptor on the cell, so insulin knocks on the door of the cell and it lets it through. But over time, if that door becomes faulty or the lock or key becomes faulty for whatever reason, it could be overuse, it could be inflammation that's damaged it. Certain nutrient deficiencies can also exacerbate that as well. So the key can't get into the lock, the blood glucose can't get into the cell, and therefore you're left with high levels of blood sugar. Your body produces more insulin to try and get it through that door, barge down that door, and get the glucose to be used as energy. But that's a very inflammatory process. And long term, that's what leads to type 2 diabetes for some people and the whole host of related side effects that come along with that condition, like cardiovascular disease can also be linked to high insulin, high blood sugar long-term as well. And the issue with the blood glucose testing that you've mentioned that you've had at your doctors previously 
is that they use a very broad reference range. So there's a huge difference between normal blood test and optimal, particularly with things like nutrients, blood sugar, sex hormones. There are certain things that are, are quite regulated, both functional medicine and conventional medicine, but a lot of the time the reference ranges are too broad and usually they're waiting for your blood sugar to go way out of whack before they can say that there's anything wrong and therefore give you a medication but over the years if it's slowly creeping up creeping up you may not notice it at the time but when you look back you can see i started off here i've now increased dramatically and i'm heading towards potentially pre-diabetes type 2 diabetes as well and even the testing that you do have at the doctor's it may be within optimal perfect ranges, but many things can interfere with that. So the fasting glucose in particular, it's usually the last thing to go out of whack as well when your blood sugar and insulin are dysfunctional. Even people with severe insulin resistance, their fasting blood glucose is absolutely perfect. It's completely normal, but it's when they when they're eating after the meals that the insulin spikes way too high and stays around for too long causing these negative effects as well and even if your fasting insulin's a little bit off at the doctor's office this could be influenced by a lot of different things as well different types of anemia can impact your blood sugar levels the fear of needles or the results could artificially affect your results as well rushing to get to the doctor's office, traffic, a lack of sleep the night before, the the meal that you had the night before as well, because ideally you should be fasting, but that could still have an influence on your morning, waking, fasting levels as well. And just remembering that it's a snapshot in time. So the same with some of these other hormones and cortisol as well. If you're just doing one snapshot one day of the week, then you can't rely on that as being how it is the rest of the time as well. So just some overview of ideal ranges that I'd want to see with clients and the, the, the ranges to shoot for. Fasting glucose, ideal for American levels, which is MGDL, would be around 75 to 90, which is around 4.2 to 5 millimoles per litre, which is our UK reading as well. And you also need to check HbA1c, which is a marker of your average blood glucose of the past three months this you can think of it of being like sugar coated red blood cells and that's a bit of an exaggeration but that's typically what they're looking for how crystallized are your red blood cells with sugar and fasting insulin is also very important ideally i'd want to see that below five even better below three as close to zero as possible basically the homer IR, so H O M A I R, that's just a ratio that shows you your levels of insulin to blood sugar, and ideally an oral glucose tolerance test, but this isn't typically ordered by conventional doctors in the UK at least. I know that some other countries do this much more regularly, which is great, but not just doing a glucose tolerance test, adding insulin to that as well to see again how your fasting insulin is but then how your insulin is responding and then coming back down hopefully to normal around baseline two hours later and you can actually check your own blood sugars using a glucometer at home i don't recommend doing this every single meal of every day because it can be expensive to buy all of these test strips and it can be just annoying to have to prick your finger and um, my fingers like turn they have like black spots all over them when I do them regularly as well so I don't want that to happen and instead of having to go to the doctors and drink this terribly sugary drink I think it's got like 50 or 100 grams of carbohydrates in there which I don't know about you but I would never consume that amount of sugar in one sitting anyway and my blood sugar would probably go absolutely haywire after that regardless of if the rest of the time it's pretty normal so you can check your own blood sugar and I recommend doing this with a meal that's high carb for you so your typically high carb meal this could be some sweet potato fries that you have a couple of times a week you have a big jacket potato with tuna and salad for your lunch it could be on a saturday evening when you have popcorn and crisp and chocolate when you're at the movies and checking your blood sugar after that because that's a much better 
reflection as to how your body's responding to a, a conventional meal that you have. And ideally, you'd want to see, not see your levels spike over around 120, which is, again, American values, or that's around 6.5, 6.7 in UK readings, you don't want to see it spike over that within two hours. So 45 minute mark, an hour, two hours, track your blood sugar, write the levels down. And that's like the highest that you want to see it really. If it goes over 140, which is around 7.8, that's heading more towards like pre-diabetes levels. So you don't want to see it anywhere near that. And then you can play around with different meals, different combinations of macronutrients different types and quantities of carbohydrates as well and i found this really useful for my pcos and tendencies towards insulin resistance too because i could eat 100 grams of sweet potato 100 grams of buckwheat and the sweet potato would spike my levels way higher than the buckwheat as well and they have like similar amounts of carbohydrates it was a similar quantity i had similar foods with them but just for some people, certain types of carbohydrates really don't work well. And Rob Wolf actually has a book on this called Wired to Eat. And he goes through how to track, what to look for, how to find the best macronutrient ratio for you as well. So that's a great book to check out um, if you're interested on this subject as well. And I have a blog. It's not a blog post. It's a guide on my website on the free download section. And if you haven't been there already, definitely check that out. There's tons of free pdf guides on different subjects like hair loss acne weight loss all of that and there's one on blood sugar levels as well so you can print that out there's a section for you to log what meals you had your readings and again it goes through the ideal ranges so they're all written down for you there as well and you can get a glucometer from a pharmacy or you can get them online just make sure it's got good reviews and make sure that you you do the test correctly as well and you can just google how to do that too and i have a blog post on my website too that's on how to reverse insulin resistance naturally so even if you don't have a diagnosis of insulin resistance it could be helpful just to get an idea as to how to regulate your blood sugar in, in a bit more detail but i'm going to go through the nutrition things and lifestyle factors that can influence it now so nutrition wise Ideally, long term, you don't want to be snacking every couple of hours. You don't have to be relying on food and snacks and carrying snack bars and bliss balls around with you all the time because evolutionarily that would have never been the case. We would have had times where there was no food at all. And yes, that is a stress on the body, but that's how we evolved and grew stronger is having these periods of time without food. And now we can have access to food any time of the day 24 7 without a problem so long term you want to be having probably like three square meals a day that's average for most people there's people who do one meal a day two meals four meals but constantly snacking to fuel the metabolism isn't really a thing and it can just keep insulin around in the system all day long which isn't a great thing because yes insulin helps to um, like fuel the cells and it helps with muscle production and muscle growth and development but it can also be quite catabolic and destructive to tissues very inflammatory and um, particularly if you've got PCOS you want to keep insulin as low as possible throughout the day because when insulin's high your fat burning mode is basically turned off insulin's a fat storage hormone so if that's constantly high you can't be burning body fat at the same time and that's why high insulin or hyperinsulinemia is one of the leading drivers of obesity and being overweight as well. So I think you need to continue with the snacks for now until you're a bit more stabilized and regulated, but then moving away from that to having maybe one snack a day and then trying some days when you're less active, not having a snack and see how you do with that, but don't completely go from eight mini meals a day to two meals because you will feel terrible and the key piece of every meal should be protein fat and fiber in that combination every time you eat every snack that you have and consuming macronutrients alone whether that's just a piece of fruit 
or whether that's just a spoonful of coconut oil that can actually mess with your blood sugar it does need to be in a good ratio balance of the three and con consuming yeah the, the ups and downs of your blood sugar is very stressful and inflammatory to the body and some people don't have any symptoms of that in a direct way so they don't feel hangry or shaky or anything like that they feel their blood sugar stable but the ups and downs and those spikes and crashes comes out in other ways so that could be putting them at higher risk of pms later in the month when the cycle's due it could be that the symptoms are more depression and anxiety tendencies it could be that they have some digestive issues because of the stress and inflammation caused by it so don't rule blood sugar fluctuations out if you don't have any of these symptoms that i mentioned earlier and let's not forget that stable blood sugar delivery of glucose and energy to the cells is the number one job of the endocrine system which is our hormonal system so if you're not fulfilling its number one job then it's not going to occur whether you have clear skin healthy regular cycles pms it doesn't occur because you're not meeting its number one need so it is crucial particularly if you've got hormone imbalances which i'm guessing that you do if you're listening to this podcast as well and if you do figure out that you have actually high insulin high blood sugar whether that's from conventional testing or you start to track your own blood sugar and symptoms then something called carb tapering could be quite helpful to help with your blood sugar management throughout the day starting your day with relatively low carbohydrates and higher proteins and fats can really stabilize your blood sugar first thing in the morning and that has a knock-on effect on the rest of the day as well there's a thing called the second meal effect so it's not just about what you're eating at this meal it's also a knock-on effect from what you had the last meal the meal before it really plays into that as well so carb cycling you start your day pretty low carb maybe something like berries or some fruits at maximum not a lot of potatoes or bread or anything like that and then as the day goes on you gradually increase your intake of carbohydrates so at lunch you've had a you'd have a little bit more for dinner you'd have your largest serving of carbohydrates as well and this not only affects your blood sugar and insulin positively it also impacts your energy levels too and your circadian rhythm because first thing in the morning your cortisol should be pretty high that's to get us out of bed to get us motivated ready to go to work and carbohydrates actually dampen cortisol so if you're having really a lot of carbohydrates first thing in the morning like oatmeal or a big fruit smoothie that's going to dampen down the cortisol and that can lead to you feeling tired sluggish or motivated and then a couple of hours later you're probably hungry again we do the opposite we keep carbohydrates and sugars relatively low that's going to keep cortisol much higher in the morning which is ideal first thing in the in the morning and then as the day goes on we want the opposite so cortisol naturally starting to decline and that's where we can include more carbohydrates to keep cortisol that stress hormone and that energy hormone at a minimum and particularly if you have trouble sleeping insomnia that wired but tired feeling in the evening you can't fall asleep then having carbohydrates in the evening is actually good because it's going to dampen down that stress response reduce cortisol so that melatonin the sleep hormone can take over and get you a nice restful sleep as well so staying organized with your meals packing some of these snacks so that you're not reaching for chocolate bars or vending machine items at work make as much food as you can at home because eating out you don't really have control over what they're putting into your foods like with the smoothies ideally you'd want some extra protein in there as well you've got some good ingredients but you want some extra protein in there as well so things like protein powders can be can come in helpful and i don't like to rely on them all the time but they can definitely be helpful whether that's something like a pea or a hemp vegan protein or an animal derived collagen that could be really helpful you can get little sachets of them to keep in your purse so that you can just mix them with water or a hot drink and get some additional protein in there as well and eggs always come in helpful to balance blood sugar you can just keep them in your bag hard boiled and that's a nice snack to have as well um so the general things of avoiding processed foods refined packaged foods are still relevant as well particularly the white products white flour white rice right white potatoes on their own can 
have the fiber removed so they're pretty lacking in fiber and that can influence your blood sugar as well and if you're hungry a few hours after eating or you're always looking for something sweet after your meals that could be a sign that your blood sugar and your insulin is not functioning optimally as well so maybe you need some more investigation into that too the long-term issues with elevated blood sugar and insulin i've mentioned a few of them but some others could be adrenal stress so if you've done a dutch test or you've been told that you, your adrenals or your sex hormones are a little bit out of whack then blood sugar fluctuations are typically the number one reason because cortisol is released when your blood sugar drops too low insulin is released when your blood sugar spikes too high and long term they're both amazing hormones in the short term and they both serve a purpose but it's the chronic unrelenting release of these hormones that start to cause damage on the body as well and long term high insulin and blood sugar in particular can lead to damage of organs capillaries and certain nerves as well this is why diabetics get issues with the eyes because they're like the smallest blood vessels in the body and they can be damaged by the the sugar in the bloodstream and same with skin health and hair growth too if the capillaries are damaged then the oxygenation and nutrient delivery to that area is also going to be impacted as well and movement's really important so the fact that you work at an office job i'm guessing you're pretty sedentary all day long so maybe considering asking for or investing in a standing desk that's going to be much more beneficial to blood sugar for the rest of the day as well and walking after meals could be a great option so if you do have any meetings maybe you can take them outside ask to go on a walking meeting or if you've got a phone call just go for a walk outside to get some fresh air to get some movement in as well and maybe you could do a little bit of burst training just to work that into your day a little bit as well so using the stairs instead of the lift just these simple things that we've probably heard before parking further away from the office going for a walk going up to the toilet for um a few times a day jump squats lunges running up and down the stairs these are all they sound insignificant but they all really do work and they just help to clear the blood sugar from the bloodstream as much as possible so sometimes when me or my clients experience that feeling of hypoglycemia that's really high blood sugar and we've confirmed that with testing the best thing to do is put on your shoes and go for a walk outside as soon as possible a brisk walk and i shared my experiment with my continuous blood glucose monitor a couple of months ago and i ate a meal that was pretty high carb for me and my blood sugar was i could see it rising on the app because it's like a a moment by moment thing and i went outside i went for a 20 minute walk and within half an hour my blood sugar levels were back to normal as well so that's really powerful and it's great that you're active you're exercising a few times a week i particularly think it would be beneficial for you to incorporate more strength training exercises into your regime because the more muscle that you have the more insulin sensitive you're going to be because muscles help to uptake glucose from the bloodstream regardless or without the use of insulin as well so if you have in issues with insulin or insulin resistance your cells are inflamed or damaged for whatever reason then muscles can actually soak up some of the excess glucose without the need for insulin as well heavy lifting is great for women you don't want to be doing like the one kilogram or two pound weights and lots of repetitions that's really outdated and not not beneficial at all the heavy lifting maybe doing less reps more weights you're not going to get bulky so don't worry about that and focusing mainly on the lower body parts is ideal because these are the biggest muscle groups so your legs your butt really work those as hard as you can because they're gonna have the biggest bang for your buck for the glucose and insulin management as well stress management in whatever way that is for you so it could be going out for a walk that i've mentioned you're getting two for one there you're getting your movement you're getting your exercise sunlight all that good stuff maybe it's meditation breathing yoga mindfulness because stress in itself can shoot up your blood sugar and your insulin levels 
and it can keep them circulated for a long period of time. So you could be eating the low carb, most healthy diet in the world that should be ideal for blood sugar. But if you're stressed out your mind, then your blood sugar can be that of a diabetic. And there's actually people who develop diabetes, not from diet, but from lifestyle driven things. And stress is probably the biggest one because the role of cortisol, which is that stress hormone I mentioned, is to circulate blood sugar, provide energy to the body. If it's needed to fight or flight or flee from a stressful event, it wants to make sure that your glycogen stores are pulled from your your stores of glucose are dumped into the bloodstream so that you have the energy and the resources needed to fight or flight if needed. So if you're eating a really good diet, but you're still experiencing symptoms of blood sugar irregulations, or if you have PCOS in particular, then stress management is absolutely crucial to get that under control as well. And sleep comes under this category too. One night of poor sleep, which was defined as, I think, less than six hours a night in one of these studies that I read. And that's not even bad for most people. Most people get a lot lower amounts of sleep than that that can actually increase your insulin resistance by up to 33%. So I'd rather you sleep in and get the rest, get the repair, than wake up and go to a spin class first thing in the morning because sleep is so much more important. That's where we rest and rejuvenate, particularly the hours between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. They are the golden hours, so they're worth double. They are the times that we tend to get the most deep sleep as well. So we're going to heal and repair and rejuvenate much more during those times of the nights as well and then supplements that could be potentially helpful in this situation but again please work with a practitioner and speak to them regarding dosage and if you're on medications then don't just go out and supplement with these but magnesium is really important for insulin sensitivity and blood glucose control as are omega-3 fats from high quality fish oil or algae oil um that's your choice just make sure it's a reputable brand because you don't want to be supplementing with toxic fish oil or products you want to keep them refrigerated if it smells fishy if it gives you reflux and fishy burps and that's a sign that it's pretty rancid so you should throw that out and if you've confirmed high blood sugar and high insulin levels insulin resistant type your blood sugar stays elevated after eating your insulin's quite high nutrients to support that could be chromium, bitter melon, gynema, alpha lipoic acid, Ceylon cinnamon. This is different than cassia cinnamon that's typically sold in stores. So you need to check the ingredients and make sure it's Ceylon. That's C-E-Y-L-O-N cinnamon. That's true cinnamon with the, the benefits for blood sugar regulation. And if you realize that your blood sugar issues are stress related, obviously focus on the lifestyle issues first but maybe adaptogens and herbs like holy basil ashwagandha rhodiola could be helpful as well in this situation so i hope that helps cara please keep me updated with your journey but i think these will be really helpful tips okay so question two is from Gemma, who's 22 hi vivian i've been listening to this podcast since your very first episode and i appreciate all the information that you share Last year, after a stressful life event, I developed eczema pretty much overnight and it seems to be getting worse, even though I'm not as stressed as I was. I have never had any skin problems in my life prior to this, but my sister had eczema as a child and teen quite badly. So far, I've tried the medical medium protocol, which seemed to help initially, but made my digestive issues much worse. Keto, which made my skin very angry and inflamed. Chinese medicine herbs, acupuncture, and a zillion supplements and topical creams. Plus some steroid creams from my dermatologist, which I just don't feel comfortable using. My doctor told me that this is just genetic and I will need to control my symptoms through stress management and the application of creams multiple times per day. But I don't understand why this would have just developed recently if this was genetic. Once, wouldn't I have had these issues from birth? It seems like it seems to me like it was triggered by stress. Now with my diet, I'm in quite a restrictive place and have developed food fears because of all the information I'm reading online. There are certain eczema diets that restrict multiple food groups and now the thought of eating gives me anxiety. 
which is horrible as I'm such a foodie and I don't even want the junk food, I want the healthy stuff. Please could you provide any insights into what I could do to help my skin? So Gemma, I've been there as well. Mine was for acne, gut issues and my hormones, but I totally understand and can empathize with you completely. And what I will say is that more restriction isn't the answer. So please try and keep your diet as broad as possible. Just taking more things out is just going to make the situation worse because you're going to be restricting nutrients and calories and healthy fats and all of that. So I urge you to keep your diet as broad as possible. And the diet piece alone is useful, but it's not the only puzzle piece. There's multiple different factors as well. And the stress and anxiety issue sounds like it is still a factor as well even though you're less stressed than you were last year sometimes your nervous system can get stuck in the state of overdrive i see this all the time people either go through a period of over exercise under eating they're divorced they have a death in their family and they're not as stressed as they were in the moment but their nervous system and their adrenals continue on that path and especially if they haven't done anything about it in that time so i would work on that first this again is different for everyone so you need to find something stress management that works for you but definitely make that a priority do some deep breathing some meditation some visualization as how you want your skin to be because that's so powerful as well the, the visualization piece too and instead of looking online and researching and even listening to podcasts like this i know that you're trying to do a good thing to try and find some answers but sometimes it can just be too overwhelming for hearing all of these different points of view like carnivore diet and then vegan raw foods and you just have no idea where to turn it can be very confusing especially if you're not in this industry like this is my job and i still get confused and overwhelmed by all of these different sides of the argument so i can only imagine what it's like for someone who also has a a full-time job and is trying to do this too so if you're not already I recommend working with someone who can help you and hold your hand through this journey as well and can give you guidance because it's hard to see the wood for the trees when it's your own health and even me like if something comes up with my health now I outsource I go to someone else because self-treating is really not the answer and it may seem like you you save money and time in the short term but you don't you just end up being more stressed spending more money in the long run rather than getting someone else to help you out and there's the analogy like would you try and fix your own kitchen sink or your own toilet leak just by watching a youtube video probably not you'd get someone in or your car if if something happened with your car i don't even know i don't have any other (laughs) examples of what could happen like your tire falls off if you couldn't do it on your own you'd get someone else who could help you and you pay them to do that for you as well so that's a really important part of it as well and the genetic piece you're right the genetic aspect is a part of it like you probably always had the genes for genetics like if your sister had it your weak link or your missing piece or your chink of the armor for example could be your skin And I'm exactly the same, like if something's off, my skin is the first place to reflect. So try and think of that as a good thing, even though in the moment it's like the worst thing ever. It's a good kind of indication as to what's going on internally for you. And you can use that as a guidance system in the future because some people don't have any outward symptoms or they just ignore or suppress them so much that it takes decades for something big to happen, like a cancer diagnosis or some incurable disease and then it's sometimes it's too late for them to do anything about it whereas eczema or acne skin issues as annoying as they can be in the moment i think it's actually a blessing for you to have something so immediate so so much of a feedback system from your body and try not to think of your body trying to do this to you to make you depressed or anxious it's trying to help you and give you indication as to something's going on inside as well and genetics are important but epigenetics are more important so the fact that your sister developed it in childhood or a teen years maybe something triggered that for her at that moment in time and for you i think the stressful event last year triggered those genes to switch on 
but the good thing is they can also be switched off as well you just need to find out what's driving that and it's not going to be one thing i know i talk about the root cause all the time but there's multiple causative factors there's multiple different things going on as well so nutrition again is just one factor and starting off with that just eat real food for the next few weeks just let go of the anxiety and the stress maybe don't go completely back to how you were eating before if this is a recent diet change but introduce little things one by one and focus on real whole foods organic as much as possible because the pesticides in crops these days can have a burden on the immune system the liver the gut microbiome they have antibiotic like effects so you want to choose the plants with little pesticide residue on the buy the clean 15 avoid the dirty dozen list if finances are an issue for you as well and the organic ones actually have more antioxidant micronutrients in them as well so you're getting more bang for your buck with that one too and focus on fresh foods as much as possible try and cook from scratch avoid processed packaged foods and even leftovers may be an issue so i know that meal prep is all the rage these days and it can be helpful for certain individuals but from a chinese medicine or ayurvedic standpoint they believe that leftover food isn't as healthy for you and it's a bit more toxic to the system but in functional medicine and my approach is the histamine aspect too there's a big link between histamine and skin conditions like eczema psoriasis acne dermatitis so it could be that leftover foods are an issue for you as well but if it means you either eat healthy by meal prepping or you have to buy a takeaway or buy your meals out i'd rather eat meal prep but just keep that in mind as well try to cook from fresh as much as possible if you're getting ready in the morning maybe put some fish or some meat in the oven while you're getting ready and then you've got something to take for lunch with you as, as well and meals out you don't really have control over the ingredients so the oils or the adding sugars and things to your meals so just focus on home cooked meals as much as possible but then again don't restrict yourself and turn down events or restaurant invitations because you want to be in control of your food because that's not the answer either you need to just do things in moderation and this isn't going to be forever you don't have to be this strict forever but when you're going through a healing period sometimes you need to really dial this in and say no a bit more often but whilst you're working on the underlying factors as well and we talked more about this on i think two episodes ago so episode 38 i think it is with laurence and as we talked about food fears and all of that so definitely check that episode out if you haven't already and i'll link that into the show notes as well and warming and cooked foods can be really helpful think of eczema as like a really dry cracked skin condition so adding more warm cooked foods more healthy fats and oils to your diet obviously the anti-inflammatory versions not like canola oil or rapeseed or anything like that but maybe olive oil and ghee could be helpful so ghee is used again in ayurvedic medicine for a multitude of different problems and it's rich in nice fat soluble vitamins as well which are important for skin function and skin barrier it could be helpful to exclude some of the inflammatory foods first these are going to be gluten dairy soy corn and refined sugar maybe eggs in some situations as well can be a problem with eczema and skin conditions so maybe try a removal of that for 30 days and then reintroduce duck eggs first because they're usually better tolerated and then if you don't have any reactions try the chicken egg yolks and then the whole egg over the next couple of days to see if any issues get worse as well but remembering that it can take time for you to notice the difference anyway so if at the end of the 30 days your skin's exactly the same off gluten and dairy then don't just add them back into your diet give it time and if you're still not seeing improvements it's a sign that other things haven't been addressed and the histamine aspect may be an issue as well so i've mentioned about the leftover foods but 
it could also be beneficial if you're still not noticing benefits to go a little bit deeper into the food sensitivity piece with a short-term elimination of things like chocolate that can be an issue cured or aged meats alcohol fermented foods citrus fruits spinach and certain nuts like walnuts and cashews these can increase histamine they can liberate histamine in the body and that can reflect in skin issues as well but i'll link some blog posts in the show notes on what histamine is how it can be connected to some of these things and some more tips and tricks for that as well but definitely don't start there start with the real whole foods managing stress first before you go into this piece because it's a bit of a rabbit hole and you really need to be sure that this is right before you just do that on your own and i've mentioned about increasing healthy fats particularly oily fish for the omega-3s which are very anti-inflammatory to the skin organ meats get another mention because they're really rich in vitamin a and b vitamins which are really important for immunity and skin cell function olive oil and high quality protein because you need amino acids to actually build and repair your skin so if you're lacking in amino acids or you're lacking in high quality amino acids say if you're on a plant-based diet then that could be a reason why your skin's not healing and repairing properly as well but then from the gut health is probably the biggest piece to look at especially if you have a lot of these food sensitivities and notice that you are actually in fact reacting to a lot of these foods then the answer isn't just to stay on that restricted diet forever it's to figure out what's going on inside of your gut maybe the stress last year triggered dysbiosis or low stomach acid or maybe you picked up a parasite around that time as well because stress favors the growth of pathogenic organisms and suppresses your immune system and growth of good bacteria as well and maybe you did you did you go on antibiotics around that time or did you were you on the pill around that time as well there could be these other contributing factors maybe you got food poisoning that year and these things like build up and then the stress maybe be the cam the the straw that brought the camels back around that time as well but don't rule out digestive issues and gut imbalances if you have zero digestive symptoms because it could still be an issue for you and a stool test could be appropriate i personally use the gi map stool test with clients to assess some of these things like parasites bacteria yeast low digestive enzyme production inflammation in the gut because skin issues typically reflect from the gut it's like a magic mirror so whenever i see skin issues with clients i'm always thinking of gut health regardless of if they have diarrhea constipation anything like that it's not a factor it doesn't matter nutrient deficiencies because many are depleted with stress and the restrictive diets that you've been on recently i've mentioned the importance of omega-3 for skin health and eczema and immunity because eczema is more of an immune system dysfunction cod liver oil could be a pretty good option in this case because it's got the nice anti-inflammatory omega-3s but also vitamins a and vitamins d as well so these fat soluble vitamins which are really important for both skin and immune health as well just make sure it's a really good quality refrigerated i like the brand rosita because it's been well tested for heavy metals and pollutants as well and a vitamin d test could be useful as well just to see where you are you may need more vitamin d because the cod liver oil contains some but it's not going to be enough if you're really deficient particularly at this time of the year if you're in somewhere like the uk this is coming winter it's dark we're not going to see sun till probably april may time so it could be that you're lacking in vitamin d in the uk levels you want to see that around 100 150 in the us that's going to be around 50 to 80 so that's like an optimal level but the conventional ranges are absolutely huge so in the uk it's anywhere from 20 to 150 i want to see that closer to 100 for optimal health as well and it could be that an omega oil blend may be helpful as well one containing gla gamma linoleic acid from something specific like borage seed oil because this has 
anti-inflammatory impact specific to the skin as well but it's not suitable for everyone but it could be worth a try zinc may also be lacking this could be contributing to digestive issues like low hcl poor immunity and poor skin barrier function as well probiotics may be useful particularly if this is gut driven but also it helps to stabilize the immune system a little bit to keep T regulatory cells in check. So this helps to balance the immune system. So it's not hypersensitive to everything, but it's also not underactive and not maintaining the response and healing like it should be as well. If you have issues with dysbiosis, SIBO, histamine intolerance, any of that, you may need specific strains and you may need to avoid specific strains as well. I'm not going to go into all of the, the specifics of that, but I use spore-based probiotics just to be safe because they are generally the most tolerated, they're the most effective, and the brands that I use are Megaspore and Just Thrive. Liver detoxification, maybe, well, it is always an important factor with skin issues and the gut issues and skin and liver tend to go hand in hand. There's three phases to liver detoxification. We need to work backwards in order of them so starting off with phase three which is the elimination of the toxins from the body so you need to make sure that you're hydrated so that you're urinating out toxins you need to make sure that you're you aren't constipated so you're having a bowel movement every single day multiple times ideally to get rid of the toxins and then you go to phase two make sure that you have the amino acids and conjugating proteins to bind up to the toxins and assist them out the body as well and then you go to phase one, which is typically pretty good for most people. Sometimes it's a bit overactive and nutrients that are involved in that are like vitamin C, B vitamins, antioxidants, but other things like caffeine can upregulate phase one detoxification as well. And if your body's finding trouble eliminating toxins out through the bowel, it's going to find an alternative pathway and that's typically your skin. So always with inflammatory skin conditions, eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis, acne, it could be linked to liver issues as well, just because we're so bombarded by chemicals, toxins, heavy metals in the modern world. And liver detoxification is a very nutrient intensive, energy intensive process. So you need nice strong levels of um, stomach acid to stimulate bile flow and all of that from the system and you need to be pretty vital for your liver to be quite healthy as well um issues with sulfur metabolism could be a missing link as well and i've seen this too for myself i really require a lot of sulfur and cofactors for sulfur metabolic metabolism this may not be an issue for you at all but it could be a missing puzzle piece for some people especially if you feel better with sulfur so these are going to be things like epsom salt baths um, garlic onions or it could be that you have a really negative reaction to some of these things either one of those could mean that you have issues with sulfur metabolism and just as a heads up iron b vitamins molybdenum and b6 are really important for that, those pathways as well but let me know if you want to do me to do another full episode on that or cover that a bit more on my blog or instagram because it's been very helpful in some of my clients journeys as well coffee enemas and certain herbs can be very helpful for assisting liver detoxification but the number one place to start is to clean up the environment and exposures that you're inputting into the system so there's no point in doing all of these things if you're still being exposed to heavy metals or chlorine and fluoride in your drinking water pesticides in your food because you just you just need to stop the inputs first before you focus on detoxification and then topical wise improving the skin barrier function is going to be very important as well probably the majority of this is going to be internal work but absolutely working on the outside too can be a game changer for some people and i recommend listening to episode 11 of the podcast with sarah sumik for more information on the skin barrier pH, the lipid barrier, dysbiosis of the skin and eczema can be known as leaky skin sometimes so we've heard of leaky gut before but leaky skin is an issue as well and it could be that the 
the barrier of your skin is permeable and then the smallest irritant detergent from your laundry topical ingredient could irritate your skin and cause a lot of inflammation as well and we need to strengthen the barrier first by avoiding certain things as well so again there's no point doing all of these fancy creams and topical serums if you're still being exposed to a lot of surfactants phthalates parabens sodium lauryl sulfate which are destroying your skin barrier and altering the ph too much as well and always patch test everything first on an area that's not as inflamed just to make sure that you're not reacting don't completely overhaul your skincare routine overnight else you're going to have no idea what's working or what you're reacting to if something negative happens and using oils on your skin can be helpful i don't recommend coconut oil on the skin because it's a saturated fat and it can clog pores it's very antimicrobial so it can lead or exacerbate dysbiosis in certain individuals as well and if your skin does tolerate oils but again do a patch test something like sunflower seed oil always organic cold press not just the one that you fry your foods in well you shouldn't be anyway but don't just buy it off the supermarket shelf is what i'm saying that can be helpful to do oil cleansing or as a moisturizer if you tolerate oils but some people don't and brands like mugu specialize in eczema creams moisturizers all natural ingredients i think they're actually safe enough to eat so that's always a good sign you should be able to consume the food the ingredients that you're putting on your skin because your skin is an organ and would you rub some of these cleansers or moisturizers or foundations onto your heart or your liver and feel comfortable doing that because if not then you may need to switch up your routine a little bit as well things like calendula calendula cream hemp touch the brand which is cbd infused i think it's a uk brand so i'm not sure if you can get that worldwide but these are very anti-inflammatory herbs as well and make sure your products are organic free from these endocrine disrupting chemicals like phthalates parabens and finally oatmeal baths can be very helpful in just soothing the itch or um, making like a creamy consistency of the water that can be helpful if you're inflamed so that's worth a try as well so be sure to give these things time Gemma three months and then reassess because there's no quick fixes there's no overnight results yes you could probably go on a, a, a steroid medication and get clear skin within a week but that's not really the answer so just try your best work with someone who can help you through this as well but don't put your life on hold and stay at home all day and hide away because of your skin you can still go out there and live your life and that can actually help you get better quicker when you have a purpose when you have goals and not letting these skin issues ruin your life basically so it's just a reflection of your internal health and your body isn't trying to ruin your life so just respect your body thank it for the messages and you're going to come out the other side with a lot more respect for your body and understanding as to what works for you so please keep me updated let me know what's going on if you've got any further questions send me an email send me a dm but yeah i'm going to finish up here because we've covered the two and we've not got time for another one but if you enjoy these types of episodes and you want me to do, continue with them more frequently or you enjoy the master classes and the deep dives into certain subjects please let me know give me feedback because it really helps me make this podcast even better because i want to do this for you i want to give you the, the information that you need and require and next week we have an episode on female metabolism and weight loss with naturopathic doctor jade teeter who you may know have heard of he's like a legend in the nutrition world and this is one of my favorite episodes that we've recorded so far so i'm really excited to share that next monday on the hormones in harmony podcast so hope you have a good rest of your week and i'll see you then